I would like to welcome you back to the second part of our morning session. And we will start instantly with the next paper, which comes from Professor Nina Detloff, who holds the Chair of Civil Law, Private International Law, Comparative Law and European Law at the University of Bonn. And since 2003 is the Director of the Institute for German, European and International Family Law. Likewise, she has been the co-director of the Kater Hamburger Center Law and Culture since 2015. From 2006 to 2008, Nina Lidloff was ad hoc judge at the European Court of Human Rights. She's a member of the Executive Committee of the Association of German Jurists, Deutschen Juristentags, a member of the board of the International Society of Family Law, as well as of the American Law Institute and the Commission on European Family Law. Since 2020, she has been the chair of the law section of the Academia Europea, Academy of Europe, and a member of the German Science Council, the Wissenschaftsrat. She has published extensively, particularly in the fields of international and comparative family law. And I will only name here the standard work on family law that has just been published in the 33rd edition, as well as a volume on family law and culture in Europe, developments, challenges, and opportunities that she has edited together with Katharina Böllewölki and Werner Gebhardt in 2014. The title of her paper is Conflicts and Tensions of Legal Cultures, which picks up one of the um, main um, points of focus of our um, first research program. And we're very curious to listen to your talk. Nina Detloff, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. It is so lovely to see you all uh, again. I just wish uh, we could all be as planned together in co-presence uh, together at the University Club uh, with so many fellows, uh, friends from all over the world uh, and uh, uh, for the human experience as uh, uh, Markus Gabriel pointed it out, uh, or in the co-presence, uh, the Geselligkeit, the sociality, uh, as well as it was mentioned, and it was as it was so important uh, for uh, us uh, and our uh, community at the center. But I'm really happy that at least we come together digitally, and uh, indeed I will talk about conflicts and tensions of legal cultures today which was uh, a topic really at the heart of our center's work, especially for the last two years. So today in the face of external threats, Europe appears more united than it has for a long time. And that indeed is a good thing in this situation. However, this unity should not obscure the fact that we are still, or perhaps more than ever, faced with the task of reaffirming the common values on which this unity is based. This also requires going beyond the mere invocation of a European value system and of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law to actually identify commonalities in fundamental values and basic principles. Entire legal spheres have meanwhile been formed by European law. However, in the area of marriage and the family, which is particularly shaped by cultural and religious norms, there is generally a greater variety and diversity of legal cultures. At our center, we have pursued the objective of approaching this diversity from a multitude of perspectives and with the experience of many bright minds, many of whom I'm happy to see here today. Conflicts and tensions, but also interactions and interdependencies between legal cultures to which special attention has been paid in the center's work can thus be observed, especially in European family law. This is the area that, that I will focus on today. How much common ground and fundamental European principles have developed on the one hand, which can be counted as part of a canon of basic values of European family law. And where, on the other hand, do divergences appear, also in view of the Union's extensions and due to increasing migration? Exploring the resulting tensions and conflicts between diverging family law cultures and how to reconcile them indeed 
requires a unique format of knowledge. At our Center of Law and Culture, this has thus been one of the challenges we have tackled. And it is therefore with great joy that I devote myself to this topic at our final conference after 12 years, during six of which I've had the pleasure of shaping its destiny together with my co-directors. In order to reflect where we stand on this issue and to determine where our future tasks lie. Now, let me start with some general comments on how the balance between unity and diversity is sought in this realm. I will then focus on specific aspects of partnership and marriage, where, in an exemplary way, despite common trends in Europe, tensions and conflicts between different legal cultures arise. Though family law in Europe is national law, its development is characterized by a noticeable harmonization and the emergence of common European principles. These are based to a large extent on the guarantees of fundamental and human rights, which ensure autonomy in the shaping of private and family life and to seek to eliminate discrimination. This process has been promoted to a large extent by the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. The court has increasingly held that there is a common European consensus in matters of private and family life, which indeed reduces the national scope for discretion and is driving forward the evolutive and dynamic interpretation of the European Convention of Human Rights as a living instrument. Notwithstanding these convergences and common fundamentals of development, such as increasing gender equality or liberalizing divorce, it remains to be said, however, that the tendencies to create a uniform law in the area of family law, which generally accompany the Europeanization and globalization process, have definitely reached their limits. In view of the strong cultural and religious influences on family law, priority is given here to the creation of uniform conflict of law rules. According to this, the law of the other is accepted in principle, but in cross-border cases, uniform criteria are used everywhere throughout Europe to determine which is the most appropriate national law, for example, for the question of a person's divorce. When selecting these criteria, which are decisive for determining the applicable law, it is important to achieve a careful balance between taking into account a person's legal cultural ties to his or her home country on the one hand, and his or her interest in integration at the current center of his or her life on the other. In the area of divorce, for example, such a balance has been achieved at the European level by granting spouses the choice between the law of their home state and that of their residence. This means that foreign law, which may well deviate and fundamentally deviate from domestic legal concepts, will continue to be applied in Germany and in other foreign states. Of course, limits exist in any case, to which I will return in a moment. <clears throat> the free movement of persons, which has become the focus of the political debate about the future of Europe, especially with Brexit, represents one of the great achievements and a common value that must be guaranteed in cross-border family relationships. Significant obstacles can arise here precisely from the divergences in national laws, as we will also see. Now, first and foremost, certainly the now widely realized equality of men and women in their autonomously organized marriage represents one of the fundamental commonalities of family law systems in Europe. Already enshrined in law much earlier in Eastern Europe, gender equality in marriage at least in legal respect, 
has been largely realized throughout Europe, from the age of major marriage, the property law, to the right to a name. These common values of a union also prevail over divergent foreign law. This is because the application of foreign law is always subject to the reservation of national ordre public, the public order. The result of the application of foreign law in a specific case must therefore be compatible with public policy and the essential principles of the forum state, in particular, fundamental and human rights. Within the European Union, a special safeguard clause also applies in the area of divorce, which is intended to ensure that the applicable divorce law is consistent with the common values of the European Union. Therefore, courts must apply their own law instead of the foreign law that is normally applicable if the foreign law in question does not provide for divorce at all, such as, for example, the, in the Philippines. The same is held to be true if the foreign law does not grant a spouse equal access to divorce on the basis of his or her gender, such as in the case of talaq divorce under Islamic law that is granted without taking into account the wife's will, which is a unilateral repudiation granted only to the husband. But this also excludes the application of Jewish law, which provides for a so-called get divorce by handing over a letter of divorce. Now, another important common feature in the development of European family law, which is admittedly still far more in flux at present, is the increasing legal recognition of same-sex partnerships. In the past 30 years, marriage as the only status relationship has been steadily joined by new legal institutions of formalized partnerships. For the most part, these registered partnerships were created exclusively for same-sex couples. Since the prohibition of discrimination increasingly included the characteristic of sexual orientation, the aim was to enable homosexuals in particular who had been deprived of marriage to legalize their partnership. Registered partnerships for same-sex couples have subsequently been endowed with more and more rights throughout Europe due to progressive recognition of full equality. And like the registered civil partnership of German law have become increasingly similar to opposite sex marriage. With regard to the existence of a legal framework for same-sex couples, at any rate, a broad European consensus is now evident. Not least for this reason, there is in fact an obligation to establish such a legal framework according to the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, recent developments, however, indicate that such legal institutions as the registered partnerships that I mentioned are ultimately more of a transitional phenomenon threatened by extinction, which have paved the way to the legal, legal regulation in many an ideological religious battle over the traditional Christian Occidental understanding of marriage. In the meantime, marriage for all has largely taken its place since the Netherlands became the first country in the world to open up marriage some 20 years ago Marriage for All has been triumphant in Europe with 13, 13 member states from the EU and beyond as well. After Germany followed suit in 2017, a gap has recently opened up in this area, especially between the West and the East and Southeast of Europe. Increasing religiosity and growing influences of the churches as well as the rise of nationalist and in some cases authoritarian currents have even led to changes in constitutions. Previously, gender neutral norms have been revised and a marriage is now explicitly enshrined in the constitution as a union between a man and a woman. When it comes to the recognition of same-sex forms of life and the elimination of discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, it must be stated that a common ground with regard to the institution of marriage is a long way off. 
the common ground is limited to a core of Europe. In view of this Europe of two speeds and the harmonization of the law, the goal at the European level is now to guarantee freedom of movement for same-sex couples and for their children in cross-border relationships. It is indeed imperative to prevent a loss of their status throughout Europe. Now, moreover, in view of this fundamental change in the concept of marriage in core Europe, the question may arise whether in the future other fundamental structural principles of marriage, which until now have been part of the core of European legal traditions, will also be put to the test. Will, for example, the prohibition of plural marriage become negotiable against the background of increasing migration from countries which permit polygamous marriage? In its traditional form of polygamy, it obviously runs counter to the basic European consensus of the principle of gender neutrality, equality. But this would also be the case with a gender neutral form that equally allowed women to marry more than one man. The decisive factor is the asymmetry that exists when a partner of one sex can be married to several of the other sex in a community in which there are reciprocal rights and obligations between him or her on the one hand and the spouses on the other. The situation would be different only if each partner had the same rights and obligations vis-a-vis -vis every other partner, and if the voice of all were given the same weight in matters of community, as is the case in polyamorous relationships. In contrast, tensions and conflicts arise in many European countries with regard to the recognition of polygamous marriages that were concluded abroad. Up to now, there has been a lack of uniform standards throughout Europe as to how the protection of existing and lived unions is to be realized. If they are generally denied recognition domestically because of a violation of public policy, for example, if maintenance or inheritance claims are asserted or the parentage of a child is in question, this is obviously to the detriment of those who need protection and whose protection the marriage regime is intended to provide. Now, comparable tensions and conflicts arise with regard to child marriages. Here, in recent years, extensive migration has led to a clash of legal cultures in Europe and beyond. Couples have, in many instances, been moving from one jurisdiction to another, with vastly differing legal norms concerning their marriageable ages. Despite the growing influence of human rights instruments and international treaties that guarantee both the freedom to marry and to stipulate the best interests of the child as a primary or paramount considerations, in many countries, marriageable ages are still rather low in some as low even as 12 or nine years. Thus, in line with a Europe-wide trend to prevent early and also forced marriages, in 2017, in Germany, the law to combat child marriages was enacted. It was the immediate result of a heated public debate that ensued after a court had recognized the marriage of a Syrian girl and her nephew that was validly concluded before their flight from Syria when she was 15 years old. The views on this bill widely diverged. On the one hand, urgent measures were deemed necessary, much in line with the purposes of the Canadian Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act, as it was called. And then on the other hand, the bill was harshly criticized as an act of legal colonialism, lacking respect for other states' legal systems while deeming our own as superior. The new act has in fact changed substantially the legal situation both with regard to marriages concluded in Germany 
as well as to the recognition of marriages concluded abroad. When the marriage is to be concluded in Germany, the marriageable age has become 18 years without any exception. This is in line with an emerging trend in Europe to raise it to the age of majority. According to the new German act, this principle of majority without any exception, not only applies to German nationals, as would generally be the rule under the principle of nationality, which governs the conflict of law rules in the area of marriage, but it now also applies to foreign nationals, also thereby to non-European countries with often still much lower marital ages. This serves to further integration and prevents the persistence of cultural practices that pressure young women living in Germany to conform to traditional roles, precluding them from making use of the chances in their new home country. However, with regard to the recognition of foreign marriages, the issue is more complex and requires more nuanced answers. Here too, there is a growing tendency in European countries towards a more restrictive approach. In accordance with this, the new German law provides that a marriage validly concluded abroad at an age below 16 years is void without any exception. While marriage is entered into between the ages of 16 and 18 should be annulled by the authorities. However, where a marriage was entered into abroad, the existence of diverging cultural traditions, religious beliefs, and legal norms has to be taken into account. They have shaped uh, the existing family relationships, which need to be recognized. Here, the reform is too rigid and lacks the necessary flexibility to protect the most vulnerable in our society children and women who have been married as children. Whereas in some cases, they may need protection against marriage. In others, they need to be protected precisely by marriage laws. Consequently, even though there are exceptions and hardship clauses, the new law appears too restrictive in this respect. And it has, I must say, now been under constitutional review for more than three years. Now, in conclusion, it remains to be stated that Europe stands on a solid common foundation in family law. The diversity of family life and forms has increasingly gained legal recognition under the influence of the guarantees of equality and freedom. This path must be pursued further. Unity in core Europe has to be consolidated, but commonalities must also be further develop, developed beyond this. At the same time, the guarantees of freedom and the protection of the individual requires that the scope and limits of accepting cultural, religious, and legal diversity be constantly applauded. Moreover, when differences persist in the treatment of families, it remains of particular importance to ensure the freedom of movement within Europe. Now, some final words. In our center's work, European and international family law has on many occasions been a mirror of the particular conflicts and tensions, interactions and interdependencies that become apparent when different legal cultures encounter each other. In order to tackle the related questions over the 12 years, the center Law as Culture has brought together scholars from all over the world, also present here, and from a wide variety of disciplines to jointly develop and consolidate this extraordinary format of knowledge. And even though this is now our final conference, this format will last and continue to develop in the form of many forged bonds and mutual projects of our joint fellowship. Our Central Law as Culture has therefore been a pioneering 
tool for further exploration. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much, Professor Detloff, um, for this uh, talk, which was at the same time conclusive and in a certain way opening up new perspectives for the future. Uh, if I may say so, as a sociologist, uh, what intrigues me is that um, all these uh, matters of family law that we have talked about in the, in the past years um, are not only um, examples of conflicting legal cultures in a comparative sense, but also they make visible the internal value conflicts that we have to uh, deal with in our Western societies itself, as the example of uh, polygamous uh, um, marriage, for example, shows. And this is just a detail I wanted to mention. I'm sure there are many questions and uh, remarks and uh, the floor is open. Martin Rumstedt is the first that I have seen. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mina uh, Detlo, uh, for this um, interesting, intriguing um, talk. Yesterday, I was, uh, by the way, uh, conversing with uh, Markus Birkenfeld in the evening, and I was mentioning that I was uh, attending the, the, the conference, and he gives uh, his regards to you. But I have two questions. Um, first of all, I would like to, to, to ask you, out of ignorance, whether um, the marriage um, arrangements uh, of um, potential immigrants play a role in their application to be uh, in the immigration uh, application. That's the first question. And the second is uh, whether intercultural mediation in different European countries, perhaps, uh, uh, what is it, try to, 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 to uh, arrive at a balance, balanced decision in, in concrete cases. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Martin Ramstedt, for your uh, important questions. Uh, indeed, uh, as you said, marriage arrangements or uh, also the existence of a, uh, a legal bond marriage that is recognized plays an important uh, role within uh, the application procedures uh, where uh, first uh, between the uh, different, we have free movement uh, among the uh, uh, European Union countries, member states, but then from uh, third countries, uh, that would indeed uh, there be uh, very important. But also between the member uh, states, uh, for instance, this question that I mentioned, uh, same-sex uh, marriage, uh, the recognition, uh, whether that is extended to it, uh, that has been a question that uh, has been much debated and also uh, been before the uh, European uh, Court of Justice. Uh, as to uh, your inter the question concerning intercultural mediation, that certainly is a uh, very, very uh, important uh, um, uh, aspect. And I think some an aspect that uh, would have to be pursued more than it uh, currently is. As far as I know, uh, there are uh, of course, is, is a strong tendency towards mediation, especially in family law, but in also in other fields, as I mentioned uh, yesterday. So uh, there is a whole area uh, of uh, law, like collaborative law, where this uh, the, the focus is to reach uh, uh, also in the interest of the uh, ongoing uh, relationships, uh, family relationships, uh, a consensus and no negotiated agreements. And I think especially in the case uh, of intercultural marriages, this, this would uh, play an important role. And um, I would uh, dare to say that uh, some more research uh, really should be done in this field to lay the foundations for uh, such an intercultural uh, mediation process. Next. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I wanted just to add something um, with regard to intercultural mediation. Uh, Martin, we have, of course, the, the very important example of Sharia councils in the, in the UK. But you know, this is something special to the UK and not the, for the whole, the, the other, other countries of the European Union, but precisely in cases of inter, um, uh, intercultural uh, marriages, it plays a big role, especially because in the UK, you have many Islamic references 
because the Islamic diaspora, if you want, is quite different from the one in Germany or in France or in Italy. You have basically diaspora from India, from Pakistan, from Indonesia, and of course here you have different rules of, of Islamic marriage, and that's why this kind of mediation is playing quite really a, 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 um, um, an important role. Just I wanted to add this. Maybe I can reply shortly to that or ask another question is uh, also to, to Nina Detloff, is that uh, best uh, good practice that that I mean now in the UK is not any longer part of the EU, but uh, do such best practices or good practices spill over into into the discussion? I think it's certainly uh, regarding the lo much longer and wider experience uh, that uh, the UK has, uh, as has been pointed out, uh, we uh, have been looking uh, into uh, that as well. And I think uh, uh, that is an important uh, aspect. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, that uh, would be the, uh, whether that would really be a best practice uh, one would have to see. Uh, I could imagine a wider uh, concept also of uh, intercultural mediation taking into account uh, more diverse uh, 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 cultures which would might be more suitable for uh, uh, Germany um, that uh, would uh, also be also some uh, there is uh, uh, there are legal differences as well regarding uh, uh, the uh, recognition of uh, religious marriages which might also play a role in this uh, because in, in Germany we have a, an obligatory civil marriage, so only those marriages that are uh, have been concluded before the registrar are valid in the eye of the state, and that is a difference uh, to also to the UK where it's valid marriages, and then you can also have the Sharia uh, courts, they play a different role uh, because of that. And we have two more questions, uh, Werner Gebhardt is first and then Sabine Meyer. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this talk that gave uh, a, a really a, a overview over all the regulatory problems and questions that do exist in the context of European uh, clashes of uh, legal cultures. Uh, in presence of uh, Jacomay, I can't avoid a specific question. He's the specialist for family law through the lenses of political sociology in France. So my question is um, more a methodological one. We have done a book together about family law and culture in Europe in 2014 with Katharina Böhle-Wölki, and I tried to bring forward the Durkheimian perspective in the last chapter of this book. And so the question is, do you need for your kind of reflections any information from the social sciences, from film, from music, from uh, any other kind of cultural studies in order to come to results that seem to be juristic in their origin? Or uh, that means, is it really necessary to have a look around and, and, and go into uh, the diversity and the complexity uh, of cultural studies as such. Is it really necessary? So it's an old question for jurisprudence, I know very well, but I would like, I didn't hear it during your talk, but you might explain it. I think uh, it is an very important uh, to really take uh, into consideration all the different uh, uh, perspectives and that also uh, uh, covers all the social sciences, the humanities and uh, uh, the uh, sociology and uh, um, even the architecture. Uh, I think uh, I still remember uh, uh, many of our fellows from the different fields that have been so enriching uh, uh, giving the perspectives like uh, for instance let's let me just give this example with the uh, architecture of the family courts uh, that uh, uh, have been uh, explored by our fellow from uh, portugal um, and uh, that really made it clear how important 
uh, the uh, this is for uh, the to reach the process of mediation and uh, also in this intercultural uh, context. So uh, I do think there are uh, numerous examples where uh, this uh, has to be fed into uh, uh, the uh, perspectives, uh, especially with a view to the, uh, not only the commonalities, but uh, with a view to the tensions and conflicts uh, that I have mentioned. I, I'm personally completely convinced. I, I would have liked to know whether you think it is necessary for the normativity problems to be resolved to have this type of information and how it is related uh, to the judicial uh, 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 reflections. And uh, so um, this, perhaps for further discussions we might have, uh, might have uh, could be uh, interesting for the future. In any case, it was uh, in the fourth year of the uh, uh, Lawyers' Council paradigm that we had a special issue with regard to conflicts of legal cultures. And then, uh, so there we tried at least, of course, also to see in the field of conflictuality, the different dimensions, how those conflicts might be resolved and sometimes also be enforced. And so there is a lot of dynamics in conflict situations, as we know. And this would be also very interesting to understand a little bit better how this works in the field of family dynamics and how uh, uh, those conflicts are not one forever resolved. They do pertain. Uh, in, fam in real families, in, in the reality of a uh, lebendigus familienrecht. So uh, this would also be interesting for future research, at least for myself, uh, for my personal interests. Thank you very much yes. again. I would certainly like to continue this uh, uh, and giving a wholehearted yes, it is important. Uh, also with regard uh, of uh, a field that you have not mentioned, uh, that is uh, uh, religious uh, studies and uh, uh, theology as uh, uh, a very important uh, aspect shaping uh, the, uh, the cultural and family law conflicts uh, that really exist within Germany and beyond. And I think as I have pointed out this, Right, Sabine, the uh, Portuguese uh, specialist on legal architecture that Nina Didlov just mentioned is, uh, of course, dear Patricia Branco, who just turned on her screen and raised her hand. Would you allow her to uh, add her comment? Because I oh, would yes. assume that I'm so it happy. relates directly to uh, the talk we just had. I'm so happy that you are here, Patricia. Uh, I didn't see, uh, I saw your name, but I didn't see your picture, so I would have addressed you directly. <laughs> so there she is. Yes, good morning uh, to everyone. Thank you very much, Nina, for mentioning my work. I will talk about uh, it a little bit uh, later when I uh, will address uh, all of you uh, at the panel on uh, the encounter of law and art, because uh, I think courthouse architecture is really an important topic. And of course, I did uh, my research on family courthouses in Portugal, and it's very important to to establish connections between the spaces where these conflicts have to be handled and resolved in terms of the state law, of course. And I think that your point uh, was uh, uh, nailed it. And so very, very, I, I thank you for mentioning my work. But I do have a question that has to do with the frontiers, the boundaries, because I think boundary has been one of the key concepts also that has been mentioned uh, uh, also yesterday in terms of the uh, research that the center conducted. And my, my question has to do with the boundaries of what is a marriage, right? And we know that uh, even in European societies, people don't have to marry anymore in order to have juridical effects of their relationships. So do you think that there will be somehow an erasure of the concept of the juridical concept of marriage and of civil union, for example? And I was also thinking, and this brings back some of the things that were uh, talked this morning, about the example of the Japanese man who married a hologram. So 
we are already talking of different things, but marriage, can we think of marriage between interspecies? Can we think of erasure of boundaries? I know this is somehow complex, but maybe it could add some more layers to, in terms of what are we talking about when we are talking about family law still, when we are talking about complexity of marriages, of family re relations in terms of intercultural relations. I don't, I'm not sure I've made myself coherent, but it, these are some of the topics that I think are now pressing us as well. So thank you very much. And uh, I hope uh, to talk more about courthouse architecture later. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Sabine Maya, your comment uh, does relate to that as well. So maybe- uh, Actually, hello, Patricia. My comment is very close to yours. Um, uh, um, Nina Adedlov, thank you for the wonderful talk. And I was wondering how the concept of a different sex registered life partnership, as of course it's possible, for instance, in the Netherlands, how this changes the view of marriage. So very close to Patricia's inside the European Union that marriage maybe ceases to be the you know valued option. So, so how, how does that work? So maybe these questions can be answered together actually. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's uh, true, and I think I already started to explain that uh, that uh, this, these changes that can be seen uh, both in uh, uh, social reality as in the law, which is reflecting and reacting to the social reality, uh, the changes in the concept of marriage, um, it's really testing the boundaries. Uh, so it's uh, the question arises, what are the fundamental uh, elements really uh, that uh, necessarily have to belong to uh, marriage that define them uh, in a legal sense? Uh, and uh, as I said, the, the constitution, for example, in, in the German constitution, it just says their uh, state protects marriage, but it does not define what marriage is that has been left to the constitutional court. And for a very long time, the constitutional court has defined this as the lifelong union, uh, which is generally not uh, uh, to be uh, dissolved uh, uh, and uh, between a man and a woman, one man and one woman. And uh, it has practically given that up uh, uh, when the legislator came and uh, said, we introduced same-sex marriage, but has been a long process. Uh, and uh, the reaction in uh, other constitutions I mentioned, uh, where uh, this the wording was the same, and they def uh, now, uh, in order to prohibit same-sex marriages, they included uh, men and women in the wording, uh, just to make that clear. But uh, I think um, uh, it really is testing the boundaries. Uh, I think marriage will, uh, for, for the foreseeable future, uh, evolve and uh, continue to exist as a social and as a legal concept, uh, but other, uh, uh, it will lose its uh, monopoly. Other uh, institutions uh, in social reality and also uh, in law uh, will arise uh, and will uh, come uh, to an existence. One being the registered partnership, which uh, initially was uh, created for same-sex uh, the marriage for same-sex couples, and only in some countries like the Netherlands that you mentioned uh, continues to coexist, uh, or in a lighter form uh, in a, with less obligations like the Pacte de Solidarité Civile, the Pax uh, de, in, in France, uh, which has very little uh, legal obligations. And there is currently uh, also a, a discussion in uh, Germany uh, and it is uh, part of the coalition uh, 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 treaty uh, to create a uh, so-called Verantwortungsgemeinschaft, a new legal institute in Germany, uh, uh, which uh, should uh, protect uh, other communities where uh, legal responsibility is taken. And this could also, and that is really something that is quite novel, uh, could include more than two uh, persons, so that it include include uh, also polyamorous uh, relationships, uh, for instance. 
but it not, could not include the and does not uh, uh, go beyond the inter uh, uh, to the interspecies that you uh, mentioned. Uh, of course, that is uh, something that has not been uh, discussed, and actually, I don't really uh, uh, see that there is a need in that sense to uh, for an institute to protect the relationship between uh, the close relationship between uh, a uh, an animal and a person even though i must say that there are uh, protections of animals uh, in their own and also in the relational aspect in the relationship aspect for instance uh, uh, there is jurisprudence on uh, the question uh, after divorce or separation, what happens with the dog who has visitation rights and so forth. So uh, things are changing. Quite a hard topic and we are already running way over time. Uh, Raja, there's a final question. Could you please cut it short? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. No, I don't have a question. Just a command because it's very important. And I guess it's important also for you, Patricia, because it is about architecture. Um, I just, you know, uh, Ramadan was during last month and um, I, I have seen a part of uh, TV Series <laughs> films in um, Syria uh, from Egypt about um, the problem of of marriage and divorce. I guess I guess they, there is um, the willing from the president as Sisi to um, um, to to make a new family law not code, but at least a kind of modification. And because of the resistance of, of religious, of Al-Azhar, so um, this, this, it was interesting because millions of people during this month are uh, watching TV. And um, it was in every, every day, you can see scenes from, from the court with a lot of symbolic of rituals of, in order to, uh, to work on this, you know? So uh, it, was, it was interesting in this sense. And the just uh, the last thing, um, the intercultural uh, regulation, uh, I, I remembered uh, in Germany, uh, there is uh, currently studies about practices, not in courts, but in mosques, uh, for example, or among some um, Muslim communities, for example, about khola, what we call khola, which is a very specific kind of divorce, not recognized in all the Islamic world and practiced precisely by women. So um, apparently we are, we will have in next years in Germany, more results and, and, and informations about that. It was, uh, sorry, it was uh, what I wanted to, to say. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, you're welcome. That was rather a comment, so um, or a number of comments, and uh, with this we come to the final paper of our morning session, which comes from Pierre Brunet, who is the only one who was not uh, a co-director of the center, but uh, I'm sure would have made uh, a, a wonderful co-director as well, so he fits in nicely here. Um, let me introduce you. It's good to have you, uh, Pierre, and welcome. Pierre Brunet is a legal scholar and a professor at the University of Paris 1, Pantheon Sorbonne, where he also serves as director of the Master of Laws program in French and European law. From 2016 and, uh, to 2019, he also served as the dean of the Faculty of Public Law at the Sorbonne. He is a co-editor and member of several editorial boards for French and international journals, such as prominently Droit et Société. Moreover, he has been a visiting professor at universities in Brazil, Italy, Japan, the United States, and Argentina. He also was a fellow at the Kete Hamburger Center Lawyers Culture from May to September uh, 2020. His main research interests include legal theory, French and comparative constitutional law, and French administrative law. But for several years now, he has also been working on constitutional environmentalism, on animal rights and environmental ethics, and on corresponding links between constitutional law and legal theory. So from his many important publications, uh, I will only mention uh, some of the most recent ones, namely works on the ecology of judges, on uh, rights of nature and legal personality of natural entities in New Zealand, 
and finally on the legal representation of natural entities. And all of this brings us right to the center of his talk, which is uh, titled simply The Rights of Nature. Pierre, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel, and I um, and congratulations to, to all of you and, and uh, of course, to the Kate and Burger uh, Center. Uh, I, I spent uh, the, 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 the months I spent over there were just fantastic and uh, and I succeeded in in uh, in making a in reading in yeah, writing paper over there about uh, biocultural rights but unfortunately it's in French and uh, and I'm not uh, drawing on on that paper uh, specifically I will I, I try to 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 sort of um, mapping of the terrain uh, of rights of nature and and i have a powerpoint i'm that's the the, the main thing i'm proud of it's that, that i succeeded in making a powerpoint for the first time of my life so i will share it uh, so here we are and uh i i try to ask uh, the question uh, if we are living in an ontological term, but I'm, I'm afraid I, I will not succeed in addressing uh, this question uh, with very relevant uh, remarks. Anyway, I, I have to say that um, in that question, uh, and contrary to what we, we could think about this uh, sentence or expression of the rights of nature, uh, there is nothing so homogeneous uh, about the rights of nature movement, and uh, we have several different inspirations uh, which can be identified. We can consider that at least we have um, two theoretical conceptions, at least, uh, maybe, maybe three conceptions. Um, we have an ecologist, uh, a clearly ecologist conception of the rights of nature. Um, where rights uh, are seen as means of protecting nature by giving it a legal voice. And this is certainly the, the perspective that uh, we, we can refer to uh, when we are thinking about uh, these uh, thinkers like um, uh, Christopher Stone, of course, and uh, also William Douglas in his dissent. Uh, in dissenting opinion on, on CR Club, uh, which was the case on which Stone wrote his first and seminal uh, paper. And we have also the same point of view uh, in this uh, Chilean uh, lawyer, Gotta Fredro Stutzin, which is uh, most of the time forgotten, but uh, he's an important uh, part in this debate. Uh, but we have, as I said, as I try to show on that um, slide that we have many, many influences and sometimes uh, a theology, um, a, a Christian uh, uh, influence too. Um, but this ecologist uh, way of, of thinking is also um, um, completed and, uh, and sometimes challenged by an economist conception of rights of nature. When I say economist, I mean, something, uh, a, a, a current uh, a movement uh, which try uh, to challenge the purely instrumental and extractivist uh, relationships to, uh, that capitalism uh, promotes and to which it subjects positively. So, and this is especially the case in Latin America. Uh, and there is another variant of the rights of nature uh, which tries or which aims to translate or transcribe the indigenous cosmogonies and cosmologies into positive law. And in this case, the inspiration is not or not only ecological, but it has an even more accentuated political dimension than the previous one and is inscribed in a post colonial context. And this is strong. Uh, a strong trend in, the, in New Zealand and, uh, and also in uh, New Caledonia, Nouvelle Caledonie, in, which still belong to France, if I can say. So we have a uh, different point of view. And I will try to show also that this um, reflection about uh, rights of nature is, is not so new, o of course, Nowadays, it's very fashionable, but it's not that new. In fact, in the 90s, 
we had in the legal scholarship, especially in international law scholarship, like as the slide shows, that we had some uh, very interesting papers uh, trying to, um, to, to promote the idea of rights of nature or, or making questions about that, uh, the relevance of that, uh, that notion. And we have in the international law too, some conventions. I, I just mentioned these two first conventions uh, where intrinsic value of the nature uh, is recognized and um, also the intrinsic value of biological diversity in the Convention of Rio, very well known. But the question we had, uh, of course, is uh, are we greening or protecting nature? And what kind uh, of protection are we uh, trying to promote? I mean, is that something for human or are we trying to protect nature in itself? And the question is, I think, very well settled uh, and uh, written by Alan Boyle in this uh, extract I, I show you when he was uh, asking um, that um, should we continue to think about human rights and the environment within the existing framework of human rights law in which the protection of humans is the central focus. And so the end is, I think, very relevant. Should we transcend the anthropocentric in favor of the ecocentric? And uh, Brukerhoff also uh, follow up on that point, uh, asking, is it possible to use control rights to protect the intrinsic value of nature? And so, of course, these uh, questions, uh, oh, sorry, my, uh, here we are. So, and, and following up also on that point, uh, Klaus Bosselmann, very well-known uh, international lawyer and legal scholar, um, asked uh, the, the, the right question. I mean, can we imagine something which could be a global environmental constitutionalism um, as a new way of thinking uh, or mindset of international law and governance? And so the idea is how to go beyond the anthropocentric way of thinking. And of course, this is linked to the uh, very, very famous topic, Anthropocene, and we have some, uh, I just mentioned these two there, but uh, we, we have many, many other papers on low and the Anthropocene, uh, one of the seminal one uh, from uh, Louis Cotze, but uh, it's also nowadays um, followed up with um, very interesting <laughs> and sometimes quite um, um, troubling um, propositions or proposals, uh, sorry, uh, from, for example, Vito Di Lucia in his uh, Rethinking the Encounter Between Law and Nature in the Anthropocene. And he's drawing on to papers on the, the works from philosophy and philosophy of nature. So, of course, all these debates are um, inside uh, a discussion in environmental ethics. And these uh, environmental ethics um, raised uh, and, 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 and gained in importance in, the, in, the, in the, the first years of the 70s uh, of, of the 20th century. But we had discussion between anthropocentrism, biocentrism, and ecocentrism. And uh, we have to, to, to mention that uh, there is not absolute connection uh, between Stone, for example, in his first papers and the movement in uh, environmental philosophy. Um, but they were uh, just in, in sort of a, of a parallel, a timely parallel. And of course, the social sciences also are uh, very, very important with uh, many discussions on environmental history and ontological and ecological uh, issues. And I mentioned these first uh, very important uh, works from environmental history, uh, Nash, Hayes, Worcester, and of course, Cronon. Uh, but also we have to mention works from anthropology, discussing non-Western epistemologies like, and, and um, revisiting uh, the notion of animism of also 
promoting indigenous knowledge, biocultural diversity, uh, and the challenge of natural and cultural. And we, we all know very well these names um, like Cohn and Vibra, De Castro, Descala, and Latour, but I'll mention also Broch and Posey and Dutfield, who, has, who were also very important for the discussion uh, in international law using um, anthropological material in order to promote the indigenous knowledge or the idea that there is a sort of uh, specificity from indigenous knowledge and recognizing indigenous rights based on this uh, specific knowledge and culture. And so now uh, I would like to, uh, to go deep in some cases, but I have to pay attention to the, to the time. So uh, I will start with the question of Ecuador. Uh, in the Ecuador, uh, the rights of nature were discussed in the Constitutional Assembly in uh, 2008. And uh, there was a sort of alliance, as I said, uh, between environmentalist social movements uh, elevated the who elevated the environmental agenda at the national level during prior decades, and the indigenous organizations uh, who were calling to recognize Ecuador as a cruel national polity. And uh, these alliances uh, succeeded in um, challenging the most conservative uh, people and the uh, constitution of Monte Cristi in 2008 uh, gave four articles um, granting rights of nature uh, and nature is identified with Pachamama which is the mother earth and uh, which is in fact the name given by indigenous uh, Indians uh, from Ecuador uh, to the earth in itself. And it means that it's not exactly our Western concept of nature. And it's identified with, in fact, all the world in, in which uh, uh, people are living. So from the beginning, we have a sort of a issue or discussion about the concept uh, we, we, we have, uh, the concept of nature we are talking about. But of course, as you can see, the constitution for this part of the constitution, but nowhere else in the constitution, uh, nature is really defined or precisely defined. Uh, the rights are mentioned, uh, but uh, we do not exactly know what nature would be or should be. And so we had to wait some, years uh, before the use of this uh, article and the first uh, plaintiff who were using this article are uh, an American couple, uh, American citizens uh, who had a, a, a property in, in Ecuador, the Wheeler uh, couple and so they, uh, they were after works on the road, uh, the river, the Vilcabamba river uh, was uh, 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 floating and and so they ask um, to uh, uh, the, 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 they, they were asking not uh, for um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the the solution uh, in court not on the basement on on basis of their own uh, right of property but on the rights of nature. And the, the, the court, the provincial uh, court, um, used the uh, constitutional uh, provisions in order to reverse uh, the burden of proof and making an application of the precautionary principle. And this first case uh, was long time ago, <laughs> the, the, the only case, but we had to wait until the judges, the Ecuadorian judges were quite familiar with the idea of rights of nature. And we had a first important case in 2015 where the constitutional court used uh, an holistic interpretation or systemic interpretation, as I said, and they tried to promote the idea of a biocentric vision that prioritizes nature in contrast to the classic anthropocentric conception. And we have to mention also that the, uh, in this case, 
it was the Ministry of Environment who asked the Constitutional Court to establish a precedent that permits the Ministry to exercise fully the respect for nature and for the, the good life in the Buen Vivir. And so the first case was uh, followed by another case in which we have also again very strong uh, declarations from the, the court where there is a very good point uh, in, in this holistic interpretation which makes that rights of nature are used as a politics, in fact. Uh, and, and, the, and as you can read, the, the court uh, uh, asserts that uh, before examining the case, uh, it should be noted that the approach to environmental issues depends to a large extent on the type of nature society relationship that one intends to use as a category of analysis. And so we see that in fact, the, the court is uh, um, acting as a sort of a representative of nature interests. And this is especially clear in that part of the, uh, of the decision uh, in uh, where, where they are uh, saying that it's clear that the rights of nature are reflected in social relations as well as in each of the elements of the country's economic system so that production and consumerism do not become predatory processes, but on the contrary tend to respect its existence, maintenance and regeneration of its elements. And we have here the, the, the clear point that rights of nature are not only uh, um, ecologically approached, but there is clearly also an anti-capitalism or challenge of capitalism uh, used here. And of course, we have other cases in which the, the, the court uh, repeat that uh, a, a break with the traditional padding is necessary and is going further and further and, uh, uh, and try to make some strong uh, elements. And the, it's not the end of the story, but I have to mention this case, which is very, uh, a very uh, close to us case in, in 2021 about a very uh, a big part of, of Ecuador, uh, a big forest in Ecuador. Uh, the Los Cedros, uh, which is considered nowadays as a very strong case uh, and very strong solution, where uh, the, the, the court, Ecuadorian court, uh, mentioned also the, the, the rights to existence of the animal and plant species in Los Cedros, as well as the right of this ecosystem to maintain its cycle, structure, functions, and the evolutionary process must be protected. And uh, with that case, the court suspended and, 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 and in fact uh, interrupted uh, the process of a, a construction of a mine. And it's a real political and ecological uh, case, a uh, very important case. And so they are uh, repeating and, and uh, strengthening the, the, the rights of nature uh, because there are legal mandates. And also they are making from the rights of nature, uh, a real, a real holistic lecture uh, reading of the constitution, and trying to uh, link the rights of nature with other rights and principles. And in fact, they are making these rights of nature constitutional rights and principles exactly as the German court made it uh, for for the 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 the, the, uh, the rights and the fundamental rights in the uh, in uh, 1949 uh, constitution or fundamental law uh, in German fundamental law. And so um, that case could be also uh, read in detail, but the, the, the main point is also that the complementarity, there is a complementarity between human beings and other species in uh, natural systems. And so we have that idea of a biocentric, that has the, the court says, uh, a biocentric conception of, of the world. But as we know, and as we can see, there's not any reference to the cultural point uh, uh, of the uh, rights of nature. They are used as uh, rights, non-specifically uh, uh, cultural or defined as uh, the indigenous um, uh, beliefs uh, could, could make it. And so 
we also have this compatibility between the rights of nature and human rights, which is also a point on which we could see uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of a contradiction or a possibility of contradiction, like in this uh, uh, paragraph where they are talking about the right of healthy environment, uh, which aims on not only to grant adequate environmental conditions for human life, but also to protect the elements that make up nature by from biocentric approach without losing its autonomy as a human rights, as a human right. So here we are exactly on that point, which is uh, challenging rights of nature and, and the challenge between rights of nature and, and rights and human rights. Uh, we also have this last case on 2022, very interesting because rights of nature and rights of animal are linked. And uh, in that case, uh, the court recognized uh, the rights for wild animal and in the name or on behalf of rights of nature. Um, I, I, I would like to add some points or make sort of a short conclusion on that point. We, we see that rights of nature are legal rights and not any more purely moral rights. We see also that the right holder is nature as a whole, but we have to insist on that point that this nature is human, non-human, and the relations between them. And also we could see that there's no any cultural reading of rights of nature, that the court do not, does not neutralize uh, the rights of nature as it was the case in the beginning of the constitution uh, before 2015. But of course, there is that risk uh, of greening uh, without ecologizing economy, as it said sometimes. But the rights of nature appears as a toolbox, a, a very strong toolbox for uh, environmental policies. I have to uh, go uh, now uh, through other cases, and I would like to, but I, I see that time is running. Um, I will uh, go through this Bolivian constitution, which was uh, not recognized, which was not uh, a constitution in which the, the, the rights of nature are recognized or granted as, as such, but we have some articles and provisions uh, mentioning that idea that we could protect environment. Uh, in Bolivia, the rights of nature are protected by through two laws, but these two laws, in fact, are um, quite neutralized by uh, many, many uh, plans from the government and uh, despite of some cases in which the constitutional court tried to recognize the integrality uh, of the rights of nature and the integrity of, of uh, the uh, rights of nature. Uh, the, the, the rights of nature in Bolivia failed uh, against this um, case of the Tipnis, which was a park, a very important park in which the government decided to uh, to, to, to cut the part with, uh, with the road. And so here we are we, we are facing a, a, a good example, in fact, uh, of the demonstration uh, and the demonstration that rights of nature are not strong enough to, 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 to break uh, the um, governmental initiative. I'm jumping to the New Zealand case, and I want to insist on that point because uh, the New Zealand case is very famous as uh, and most often uh, presented as something which is absolutely new, which is not exactly true. And it's uh, also presented as the, the main example of the um, granting of rights of nature. But in fact, we have to mention that the idea that uh, the New Zealand uh, recognized a river as a legal person, first of all, is not that new because a, a, a park was recognized as such. But we have to insist on the fact that the idea of giving the personhood to a river or to uh, natural entities or elements of nature uh, was first presented as a way of fighting uh, against 
uh, the commonalities uh, and the commodities of, uh, of the territory. And it's a post-colonial context which, which uh, offers us the idea, the, the, the main idea. And uh, we, we can understand the, the specificity of, that, uh, of the rights of nature in New Zealand through uh, the post-colonial lens. And the first proposal uh, came from uh, Alan Frame in the a very important paper, um, unfortunately not so often mentioned, uh, where he, he said that the proposal uh, he, he made was a small contribution to the ongoing search for the New Zealand jurisprudence, which reconciles rather than divides our principal culture. So it's, it's a real cultural problem, in fact, a real cultural issue. And the uh, personhood for a legal personhood for uh, elements of nature is, in fact, a pragmatic compromise and not that much an ecological based policy. And we have also uh, other proposals from Morris and Guru uh, giving voice to rivers. <clears throat> and then this uh, proposal. Uh, was in fact adopted and um, after agreements we have uh, the Te Awa Tupua Act, nowadays very well known, uh, in which uh, the uh, legal personhood of, of the river is uh, recognized as such and uh, we have this uh, part of the Tupu, Te Awa Tupua Act uh, mentioning that the Te Awa Tupua, which is the river, but not exactly the river, or, or the whole river and so the ecosystem is uh, uh, considered as an indivisible and living whole comprising uh, the Vanganui River uh, from the mountains to the sea, incorporating its tributaries and all its physical and metaphysical elements. And we see here that, in fact, law and positive law uh, from New Zealand is a way of integrating uh, beliefs and cultural uh, way of thinking nature. But this nature is, of course, not our Western concept of nature. And we have another case with a, a, a park, the Te Urewera Act uh, in 2014, which, is, was, which was the first act uh, granting legal personhood to um, a, an element of nature. But, we have also to mention that this conception of nature from the Maori was not uh, devoid of responsibility uh, to the environment and not devoid of any use of environment, of course. Um, Maori, as it's well known, were, were not preser prever preservationists at all. And they could use nature, of course. It's not the pristine nature which is granted here. Uh, of course, we have also a cultural conflict, which is quite interesting because, in fact, some Maori are contesting uh, the idea of legal personhood because legal personhood, in fact, is a Western concept and not uh, a, a Maori concept. And some are making or objecting that, uh, in fact, the concept of legal person remains a Western legal concept and that the construction remains encored in the common law and by which this law attempts to translate conceptions that remain foreign to it. And so even if, or despite this, the, the, the Maori language used in the, in the uh, Te Awa Tupua Act, this point is uh, making a sort of a new colonialism. And uh, and so we, 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 we do um, have this uh, challenge uh, and this issue, how to translate or can we really translate uh, Maori conceptions in the positive law when the positive law is made by uh, a Western way of thinking uh, nature. And so <clears throat> this uh, act, the Te Awa Tupua Act, is still criticized and um, the, the, the Maori are, in fact, not claiming the ownership of the, of the river, but they are claiming for a, a way of controlling and, and mastering the river and, and, in fact, managing the river. And so nowadays, they are custodians, they are guardians for the river with the uh, New Zealand uh, government, but, in fact, 
the Te Awa Tupua Act is a way of neutralizing a property much more than ecologizing uh, economy uh, from, from the river. And I could, if I could, I don't know because I, I'm just, Daniel, just tell me if I can follow up on the Colombian case and I hope it's not going too quickly. Uh, the, the, the Colombian court uh, used the Colombian uh, constitution, uh, 1991 constitution, in order to give also a holistic reading of the, of the constitution and, and uh, making some sub-constitution in it uh, and trying to uh, emerge to, to, to make um, to create a sort of ecological constitution from 34 provisions. Uh, they are here in French, I'm sorry. But from that, <clears throat> uh, the uh, court uh, uh, issued very interesting decisions from 2015 and until 2016. <clears throat> we have uh, decisions in which the, the court uh, promote or is promoting the idea of an ecocentric way of thinking relationship between humans and nature, as you see here uh, in the in the in the slide, and uh, there is that strong assertion in which uh, the strong statement from the court in which the human being is one more being on the planet and dependent on the natural world. And these decisions is, has been followed with another one, which is the main decision nowadays. It was, uh, it's supposed to be uh, issued in November 2016, but in fact, it was decided later and it was uh, post, uh, anti-dated, if I can say it in English, um, anyway, <clears throat> in this decision uh, about a river, the Choco, the, the, the Atrato River basin in the department of Choco, the court decided, while the uh, plaintiffs were not asking that, uh, the court decided by itself uh, to recognize uh, or to grant the legal personhood to this river and uh, mentioning that there is an interdependence link between human populations and this natural world. And of course, here we are uh, facing a very good uh, example of sort of an imitation of, uh, of the New Zealand case, but with another basis, in fact, because uh, the, the, the court cannot uh, refer to the cosmology of the, uh, the population, which are uh, three different populations. And so they are using um, uh, the, the, the model uh, from the New Zealand in which uh, the, the populations are considered as guardians of the, uh, of the river, like in New Zealand. But the, the basis of the, of the decisions is in the idea of uh, biocultural rights. Um, and I'm sorry because the uh, slides with the biocultural rights is here. Um, they are granting, uh, granting their decision on the idea that there is a new legal approach called biocultural rights, uh, where the central postulate is the relationship of deep unity and interdependence between nature and the human spaces, in which and which results in a new socio-legal understanding in which nature and its environment must be taken seriously and enjoy full rights. And so uh, this way of thinking interdependence between uh, uh, human populations and, and natural environment uh, has been also um, taken seriously later. And we have uh, many post atrato cases in Colombia. Uh, nowadays, um, as far as I know, we have 19 rivers uh, involved in judicialization processes, but also uh, outside of Colombia and many countries are referring to these uh, Atrato case nowadays. Um, 
and uh, in Mexico, also in the cities of Mexico, and uh, also in US and Canada. And we have new developments also in Sweden, but also in Panama. Uh, last, last February, uh, <clears throat> as uh, the slide shows, the, the, the president signed the uh, 2187 Act, in which, as you can read, uh, the purpose of this law is to recognize nature as a subject of rights, as well as the obligations of the state and all persons, whether natural or juridical, juridical and to protect the, the, the nature. And so we are, here we are, and I think that I could stop there. Uh, as, we, as we can see, um, <clears throat> there is a, a real, uh, uh, the big point uh, is that <clears throat> these rights of nature uh, are, I think, used in very different uh, uh, way of, 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 uh, of, of um, making uh, these rights as uh, legal rights. <clears throat> and we also have, we have both a sort of a moral discourse, but also a, a political discourse. And these rights are, in fact, a sort of a toolbox uh, and the question, the main question for, for European uh, population is, do we really need that kind of way of protecting nature? But of course, in Western uh, law, we have other uh, tools and the toolbox is full with many, many other, uh, other uh, way of thinking nature. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much, Pierre, for this. Uh... Um, vast and uh, also empirically rich uh, presentation, um, which which opens a whole new debate for our discussion here and, and surely introduces a, a crucial topic um, for the discussion um, about law and culture in the 21st century. I'm sure there are a lot of comments and questions and uh, I would like to open the discussion. Now, I saw Patricia first, and Jan Wundrup second, and then Judith Hahn. They were almost uh, raised their hand at the same time, but this is the order right now. Patricia, go. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thank you, uh, Professor Brunet, for your very interesting presentation. It's also very refreshing to hear about the rights of nature instead of hearing about algorithms in justice. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, I will be very brief because I have to leave to get my kid from school, but two points I wanted to mention. One has to do with art. And recently here in Naples, where I am in Italy, there was an exhibition called Rethinking Nature at the Museum Madre that uh, uh, Professor Gephardt knows very well, where there were a lot of issues that you mentioned that were put into art. And so this idea of thinking, who are we? Who, what are the relations between us and nature? What is our concept of nature that you were mentioning is very important. Another issue that, and this is a question, has to do with the recent um, court uh, um, actions that were uh, brought to the European Court of Human Rights by children uh, that have to do with climate uh, change. Of course, this is not the rights of nature, but I wanted to hear from you if you think that this combination between actions that are brought by children who usually have less rights than adults could be a way of also extending and bringing more into action regarding the rights of nature. I'm not sure I made myself clear, but it's clear. It's I clear. wonder if there is- Of course, I, I Thank could you. not mention everything, but of course I had to, in fact. If I was really <laughs> a good legal scholar, I, I should make the link between uh, the, the, the case I, I was mentioning and of course the climate uh, justice or climate change justice and climate change cases. And in Europe nowadays, we are facing many, many cases uh, of climate change. And we have also to mention the, the <clears throat> The great decision from the court, the German court, um, about the the the, the uh, Schutz Gesetz, uh, and uh, and when I was that was I try to suggest in the conclusion, but I'm sorry, I, I, the time was running. But of course, it's not because we are not using uh, the word rights of nature that we do not use 
not the concept exactly, but the idea that in fact we have to find way of limiting uh, uh, the um, in fact limiting economy and limiting the way we think our economical or economic growth. And that's the point. The main point, in fact, is that we are in 2022, we are back uh, to the um, to these uh, questions, how to limit growth. Uh, and, and the only way to do that is to challenge uh, a little bit our way of thinking economy and the way of living in our capitalism. <laughs> That's why Anthropocene is also a capitalist scene, of course. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you for the very interesting um, presentation. I have a specific question which refers mostly to your second um, part of um, your talk. Um, it's about a certain ambivalence of this um, right of nature movement. Um, you, you mentioned the different nature society relationships and cultural um, conceptions um, of the world. And uh, you already mentioned uh, anthropological studies, uh, for example, Descola, who has written a lot about that, um, but um, I asked myself and um, to what extent, and I mean, you, you underlined that the concept of a legal person is a Western concept, and to what extent do we have here a cultural misconception or forms of neocolonialism, um, because in the um, process of this um, yeah, legal person industry, which um, has become um, a worldwide phenomenon because um, you, we have all, uh, also cases in Africa, and meanwhile, and, and there, there are a lot of um, Western um, actors involved and uh, Western N NGOs um, who, who claim to do justice to indigenous worldviews. And I would be interested in your opinion to, um, are this really, um, processes of doing justice to this indigenous um, and people or are uh, these forms of yeah, neo-colonialism, um, deformations um, or whatever? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. It's a very tough and difficult question, <laughs> very complex. And I, I don't know if I could uh, give a simple answer uh, right now, but the fact is that uh, the indigeneity or the autochtonization of law uh, is, uh, is both, um, how could I say, it's, it's both um, a moral aim and, and also a political aim. And we, 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 we saw that in the, exactly in the 80s or 90s of the 20th century, uh, indigenous people are, were uh, drawing on the idea of a specificity, of a specificity of special knowledge, or specificity way of, of knowing their own uh, world, in order to, to um, ask for more rights. And so they were drawing on anthropological works, and anthropologists were also drawing on uh, um, indigenous beliefs and all these uh, the both uh, these both currents uh, merge in order to make rights for indigenous people recognized as such but of course there were there was in these discourse a sort of a construction a social construction and the idea was sometimes criticized as uh, the idea that this social construction um, Created uh, the, the the good uh, the the good was uh, le bon sauvage uh, the, 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 the 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 you know the good indigenous people always very um, uh, caring nature and uh, having uh, and, and being the uh, the perfect ecologist and uh, we we have many many not so many but we have many papers from anthrop anthropologists uh, criticizing this social construction has a way, in fact, of uh, um, a, a sort of a, um, a shadow dressing. And, uh, and uh, um, this was anthropology, or in fact, politics 
dressed in anthropology. But anyway, we have a real conflict here, and, and it's a big issue. How could we, what do we want to do? I mean, do we want to translate in positive law some beliefs as it was in New Zealand? And in New Zealand, it was a clear case of a political compromise, or do we want to use our concept of legal personhood in order to not to make this political compromise in a, a big cultural, uh, bicultural or plurinational uh, country, uh, but in order to shape a sort of a, a ecological way of life or ecological economy. And I think that, uh, of course, legal personhood is just a tool and it's not enough, of course, in order to, trans to transform uh, capitalism or to resist uh, to industry. Uh, and the main issue here, of course, is that uh, in many countries, uh, in Africa, but also in Latin America, uh, the money is not coming from them. It's coming from us, if I could say. It's coming from Western uh, countries or Chinese. Uh, and so the main problem is that are we greening economy just with the idea that we have guardians uh, of some elements of nature? Or are we trying to, as I said, ecologizing our economy, uh, making not only guardians for some elements, but um, imposing to industry uh, the respect of, uh, of natural life or a sustainable way of uh, exploiting or extract, uh, extracting resources. That's, that's the main point. And law is just a tool in the toolbox. So the toolbox is also made with economy and, and social uh, 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 instruments. Okay. We have three more questions and I would like to ask all three of you uh, to cut it short if possible, because we are running into our lunch break. Um, more and more, Judith, you're the first, uh, sorry, Nana Gephardt second, and uh, finally Martin Ramstedt. And with this, I would like to close the discussion. Yeah, maybe it's just a remark, or maybe it's naive in the context of, of, of what you just uh, discussed, um, also what you said, Jan uh, Suntrup. And um, I was just, maybe it's my, my naive view of, uh, of, the, um, of the matter, that uh, this whole, you called it an industry, the legal person industry, um, I always, expect, well, I perceive these cases um, maybe a bit more positive. Mm, you, you refer to the Whanganui River um, Act, but you could also refer to, to the Sandra case in Buenos Aires, um, where th this discussion, could, could a human aid be a non-human person? Um, it's the idea of what I see kinship or closeness to humans or autonomy also, somebody have a person having an own interest. So um, I always perceive these cases as, um, well, they're strategically, yeah, 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 but it's also um, experiencing nature as, a person as um, something with an own interest in life, uh, pursuing that interest. So I'm just wondering if if toolbox is a, a form to devalue the argument. Well, maybe we could take it more optimistically and say maybe it's also a claim to experience nature as something of its own with autonomy and so on. But maybe that's just my, my naive philosophical whatever view of the matter. No, oh, you're right. I mean, it, this is the, the, the main proposal from, from philosophy and other social sciences. The idea is to, uh, to, to introduce a new paradigm. And, but the problem we have, or the problem I see, and, and I'm sorry to see the problem before the solution, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you can claim that uh, there is a change of paradigm. And, but I think that this change of paradigm is not, uh, cannot be, um, I mean, you, you cannot call for a new paradigm uh, without the, the, the real uh, constraining, uh, binding instruments for that. So I, I do, um, I do uh, take seriously the idea that we could change the paradigm, but I also have to be realistic and, um, 
in that case, uh, we see that there is a um, real effort from, uh, from court, but also from governments, from, from uh, lawmakers, in order to change the paradigm. But the same lawmakers, for example, the government in Bolivia, was in the same time uh, has you know, a real Macronian <laughs> government. And he was first claiming for the, the change of paradigm, but also giving, uh, giving many, many parts of the country to the neoliberal uh, logic. And so how can you articulate that? We have in France a, a, a president, the, 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 the second time president, who tries to show that he could be a neoliberal president, but also an ecologist. So I try, I'm just asking, okay, why not? But I think that there is a real contradiction. I mean, you cannot try to change the paradigm in the neoliberal framework. <laughs> so change the framework. And if the framework is changed with the new paradigm, with the idea that nature exists in itself, so great. I do, I do, I, I do buy the, 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 the new paradigm, of course. And, but we, we have to see that uh, the, 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 the only uh, uh, introduction of rights for nature or rights of nature is not enough. It's just the beginning of something. Uh, and it's also the result of something, but it's also always a result of a compromise. Even in Ecuador, there is a compromise between activists and indigenous peoples. The indigenous people do not want exactly the same as the ecologists. I mean, they want their way of life protected, but it's not exactly the nature that the Western activist ecologists are claiming for. I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm clear enough because my, I know that my English is not that good, but, but that's, that's the, real, the, the real issue is here, I think. Crystal clear, I think. Uh, Werner Gepard. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation uh, with such a rich material. Uh, I would like to ask you to have one day in Paris or in Bonn the time to try at least to apply the Lois culture paradigm to uh, this field that I would like to call and to name ecological normativities mm -hmm. alongside with uh, pandemic normativities and other types of normativities, because then we could start with the concept of classical legal concepts of legal person and who is the bearer of rights. And we have seen that there has been a change just because of traveling concepts now coming from pre-modern society to modern legal systems on the one side, then the relationship with uh, uh, religion uh, and religious elements in interpreting nature is so crucial starting with uh, Mary C. Douglas and a lot of others in between uh, the different great religions, but also a lot of indigenous perceptions uh, of nature. When uh, uh, John Muir came to Yosemite Park, he said, uh, God's first temple, how shall, shall we preserve uh, uh, this uh, uh, landscape? Yeah, this nature. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, we can find it in all the great religions, a very specific way to see and perceive nature. Then of course, the globalization effect, the conflict of nature, uh, the, the aesthetic aspect that we uh, try to, to, to identify. And in the uh, afternoon, we'll have discussion about. And in the end, what is the Geltungskultur behind? Is it in the name of nature that we protect nature? Is it in the name of the cosmos? Is it in the name of, of, of God? In the name of what that really gives the legitimacy to preserve the world? And so we would join the Fridays for Future uh, guys and girls, you see? And uh, so that this was the question of, uh, of Patricia in the beginning. So I think one could bring another kind of order in your presentation by doing this way, whether 
what the outcome will be, I don't know for the moment. I was working on that during your conference, but I think it could be fruitful. And I would like to propose uh, this kind of, of afternoon discussion in Paris or in Bonn, whatever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Werner. Uh, your, your, I, I, do, I, I do try to, I will try to follow up on your proposal. And, uh, and I do accept, of course, the, 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 the framework you're, you're making. Uh, just one point, maybe, if I do understand well, uh, of course, the, 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 the nature in itself doesn't mean, I mean, just to follow up also with the, 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 the answer I tried to make with, uh, to Judith, uh, it's, the, the, I think that the main point is the notion of interdependence. Uh, that's the, the, probably the, the, the common point to all the uh, rights of nature cases, uh, where in fact, despite the idea that uh, we are promoting biocentrism or ecocentrism, uh, in fact, the real point that we, 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 we could imagine law could uh, make would be to strengthen the interdependence and to protect not nature as itself without humans, like John Muir, in fact, wanted nature to be protected. But uh, the, 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 the base way to, to, to think uh, this protection would be the um, protection of the relationships and so the interdependence. And we had exactly the same problem with animals. I mean, we, we could protect wild animals for themselves and in order to protect their, uh, their own property, in fact. But we also have to protect animals in the relations we have with them. And uh, I, I'm not trying to, uh, and I'm not um, claiming for um, a, a vegan world. Um, I think we could think uh, a, a way of using animals or having food from animals, uh, but also making a sort of compromise, um, strengthening their, interdependence we have and they have with us. Uh, and so we could try to think um, some ways of um, having that kind of relations with nature too. It becomes a final and super, super brief <laughs> comment or question from Martin Ramstedt, please. Oh, yay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the issues you have uh, been raising, uh, Pierre Brunet. Um, First of all, I mean, like, like law, anthropology is, of course, both in its applied and its action version, action anthropology and applied anthropology have been, of course, rather political, as has been the science in itself, and uh, always um, raising criticism, of course. I think what is at stake here is what you would like to protect. If you want to protect nature, do you want to protect nature? Do you want to protect indigenous rights? Or do you want to reframe national culture, like in the in the, in the uh, New Zealand case. In, in the US, we have seen that if you just want to protect environmental rights and create nature parks, then, then let, don't, don't let Native Americans, uh, don't grant access to them uh, in terms of um, uh, visiting and performing rituals at uh, ancestral, sacred ancestral places. That, that is high, highly controversial, of course. I think it's, it's really about what kind of relationship do you want to uh, establish between nature and, and humans? And, and uh, ultimately it's about property rights too. So would you want to grant uh, a certain, or would you want to protect a certain uh, sustainable uh, relationship between nature and, 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 and the human and human uh, or a certain society? And do you want to uh, regard like Elinor Ostrom, uh, under certain conditions that uh, that uh, local indigenous peoples can be the best stewards for it, maybe or maybe not. Often it is a protection against foreign investment and totally totally exploitation, total ex exploitation. Uh, I think it is uh, questionable if you if you grant property rights only to to indigenous peoples without and the involvement of other citizens. So these are questions that that needs to be balanced. That need to be balanced. I think that uh, New Zealand has has uh, has uh, 
done well compared to other countries and other societies in learning from from uh, from its uh, um, history of accommodating Maori rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remark and, and your questions. And of course, the, the, the main issue is that what do we want to protect? And, and I think that what I try to suggest is that there is uh, the, the, the idea that there is a, a unique model uh, of rights of nature is uh, um, strongly um, questionable and, and, and strongly, in fact, very <laughs> strongly weak, if I could say, uh, because, uh, and that's my main criticism, if I could say, against the uh, legal scholarship and, and scholarship uh, um, promoting the idea of rights of nature. I mean, I, I, I'm not uh, defending one model because I think that there is no one model of rights of nature and and my skepticism is not exactly against rights of nature for themselves but it's against the idea that we are living or we are facing a sort of a, a transnational uh, model of rights of nature. Uh, many of my colleagues in, 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 uh, in law do uh, content uh, that it's 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 done. Uh, we have Ecuador, we have New Zealand, we have Bolivia, we have uh, Australia, we have U.S. cases, we have Canada, we have also. Oh, let's go on and and do give the legal personhood to the Seine, the Garonne, and uh, and the and the Rhine and everyone. But I think that's not the point. I mean, <laughs> it's not that so clear and so simple. Uh, three years ago, I remember that uh, um, a, a short paper in, uh, in a newspaper, in French newspaper from an association uh, of legal scholars and other, uh, were claiming to give the legal personhood to the Seine because the Seine was an ecosystem. So, is that enough? <laughs> and and what, what are the, the, the cultural basis for that? Uh, we are not Maoris. We, we, we do not believe, uh, we do not need uh, to, to believe uh, that uh, nature has rights because, in fact, rights, our rights are Western rights and they are, first of all, for people and, and human beings. Of course, we have corporate rights and we do recognize fundamental rights for corporate, but in fact, we do that because we are still seeing uh, and uh, taking reality through the, the, the human lens. So it's not so simple. If we want to, to create a transnational model, we have to, to not to call it uh, rights of nature probably, but we have to, to find either other words or to uh, um, uh, giving up this idea that one transnational model is possible. I think that we are facing the, the big issue is that we have local experiences and these local experiences are much more different than they are uh, uh, common, if I could say that shortly before lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much and to all the discussants.